This is my recent talk from Glow in Asia in Seoul titled WH Quantification in Alternative Semantics. We commonly think of question formation as being the primary use of WH phrases, but in many languages WH phrases are also used for a range of quantificational functions. So in a particularly well-studied paradigm, in Japanese the word dare is regularly translated as who and is used for questions with who, but we can also use that same word dare with a variety of different morphemes attached to it, different particles attached to it, for a range of different quantificational functions. Kuroda described these as therefore indeterminate phrases, referring to them as nouns that behave like a logical variable. Many languages in this way combine a WH phrase with other particles to form different quantifiers, and cross-linguistically, two of the most common types of morphemes that are used for this purpose are disjunctive particles and scalar focus particles. So the driving question of today's talk is what explains these prevalent combinations? Why specifically is it disjunctors and scalar focus particles that show up time and time again across different languages when we're looking at these WH particle combinations that give us quantification? So today I'll present a framework for the compositional semantics of alternatives which models various attested forms of WH quantification and also helps us explain the prevalent use of disjunctors and focus particles in WH quantification. Here I'm going to be building on the basic intuition that WH phrases and also disjunctors introduce alternatives in the grammar and in particular I'll be introducing and developing based on the view that those alternatives develop uh, introduced by WH phrases and disjunctors are actually formally the same objects in the grammar as Ruthian alternatives for the computation of focus. So my answer to that driving question about why focus particles and disjunctors are cross-linguistically common in WH question is that these items are unique in the grammar in being able to quantify over alternatives. I'm going to show you that with some help, and we'll have to define what that help is, with some help those particles are able to quantify over alternatives introduced by WH phrases using their regular focus particle semantics. This approach is going to derive common combinations such as WH even NPIs and WH disjunction indefinites and also a number of other combinations that have been discussed less in the literature. And we also want to combine this framework with a story about how languages are allowed to vary in their inventory of WH quantification. And I'm going to claim that there are at least two, lar two major ways that languages vary. First, in what operators or what combinations of operators are spelled out morphologically when we actually observe something that looks like a focus particle or a disjunctor. And second of all, that the syntactic distribution of the so-called helping operators can also vary across languages. So here's a basic roadmap. We'll talk about uh, some background on alternative semantics. I'll present my framework very quickly in sort of a sketch. And then we're going to spend most of the time going through various case studies uh, rather quickly as well, though. Um, and then finally, I'll conclude with some thoughts on how languages vary. So first, let's start with an opinionated introduction to alternative semantics. Alternative semantics is this framework developed by Mats Ruth uh, in the 80s and 90s um, and adopted by many since then for the interpretation of focus. In this framework, we keep track of two dimensions of meaning. So for any syntactic object alpha, we compute its ordinary semantic value. That's the regular semantic value we know and love. We're going to put a superscript O on the interpretation function for that purpose. And we can also compute an alternative set for that same object alpha. I'm going to put a superscript alt there, um, although in much of the literature, uh, superscript F for focus is used. Um, this alternative set is roughly the set of all of those ordinary semantic values of alpha that you would get if you substituted any focus, part, focus marked parts of it with other contextually relevant alternatives. So let's see how this works in action in the contrast in three and four, Mary only bought a sandwich versus Mary only bought a sandwich. So we're going to look at the material in the scope of only. I'm going to abstract away from how only is scoping over all of that material. 
but the ordinary semantic value in the sister of only, let's say, is Mary bought a sandwich, that ordinary semantic value is just the regular proposition, Mary bought a sandwich. We can also call this the prejacent proposition. But the effect of focus, the position of focus, is going to matter for the computation of the alternative set. Alternative semantics provides a recursive procedure for actually computing these alternative sets compositionally using this process often called pointwise or Hamblin composition. So we get a set of alternatives here that are propositions, including the prejacent Mary bought a sandwich, but also others that vary in the position, in this case, of the object. So Mary bought a pizza, Mary bought a salad, let's say. And the meaning of only a first approximation is that we're saying yes to the prejacent and no to the, all the other alternatives. Now, the same basic calculus is going to also be able to get us the meaning in four. So now, the, notice that by shifting the position of focus, the ordinary semantic value, the prejacent proposition, doesn't change. But the alternative set does. Now the alternative set ranges over different options with different verbs in them. But the meaning of only is the same. Only can just say yes to the prejacent, no to all the others. So here's a first pass quick sketch of what a lexical entry for only might look like in this, uh, in this framework. Um, this is a very, very simplistic view of what only is. And we can also use this same framework, computing alternatives in the exact same way, and define lexical entries for other focus particles as well, things like even. And so there's a first approximation of that in six. Now, I'd like to highlight three points about this approach to the interpretation of focus, which are basically existing assumptions in the literature that I just want to highlight. So first of all, under this Ruthian framework, notice that for any syntactic object alpha, it's going to satisfy that the ordinary semantic value is in the alternative set. That, as long as you're just using alternative semantics for focus, actually you're always going to be satisfying that. I'm going to codify that as a requirement that every clause satisfy interpretability defined in seven. So to interpret alpha, alpha, the ordinary value, must be defined and be in the set of alternatives. Second of all, focus particles are unique in the lexicon in actually being able to look at the alternatives in its scope, in its sister, and quantify over them. Other lexical items aren't able to do that. Instead, they compose pointwise. They just compose with each individual alternative in a systematic fashion. And third, once alternatives from a particular focus are used by a focus particle, that same focus, that same set of alternatives, can't be used for the quantification of a higher particle. Um, this is an empirical question, and there's literature that has debated whether this is really true, exactly as I've stated it here, but I'm going to claim that at least as a default, uh, first pass, uh, assumption, all focus particles have this property. I'm going to call this the resetting property and define reset in eight. So I say that an operator is resetting if it lexically specifies that the alternative set after that operator has applied is a singleton set of the ordinary semantic value that it generates. Okay, so that's our basic introduction to the semantics of focus. Now let's take a look at how this framework deals with WH questions. So Hamblin proposed that the meaning of a question is the set of possible answer propositions. So for example, who does Alex like can be thought of as the set of propositions, Alex likes Bobby, Alex likes Chris, Alex likes Dana, etc. Now here I'm going to present a modern implementation of this idea in that Ruthian two-dimensional semantics that we've seen from focus. So the idea here is that a WH phrase has a particular denotation exemplified in 10, where there's a set of possible values, roughly short answers to the question, that will be the alternative set denotation, but there's no defined ordinary semantic value. So who its ordinary value is just undefined. If we build a sentence based on that, a clause based on that, like Alex likes who, pretend this is a WH and C2 English that we're considering, the ordinary semantic value is undefined here, 
but the alternative set denotation is, has some content to it, right? This is a non-singleton set of propositions, which actually looks exactly like what we want to end up with as the denotation of a question. But notice that this violates interpretability. There's no defined ordinary semantic value, that's the thing we actually want to interpret, and of course then that can't be in the set of alternatives, so we violate interpretability. In order to fix this, we need some extra glue. Uh, we need a helping operator. So we're going to have an operator that lifts this meaning that we developed in 11 into an interpretable question. And for that purpose here, I'll be using the uh, name Alt-Shift for this operator um, from Hadass Kotek's work. So Alt-Shift takes its sister's alternative set and says now that's the ordinary semantic value and it's also a resetting operator, so it says that the alternative set that you end up with is the singleton set of that meaning you just constructed. In practice, we see this in 13, Alt-Shift applies to the clause that we built in 11, and now we get the ordinary semantic value, which is the question denotation that we want, and the alternative set is the singleton set of it, and that satisfies interpretability. Finally, we're going to introduce some background on the analysis of disjunction in alternative semantics. So, authors such as Alonzo Ovalle and Aloni have proposed that alternative sets are also used in the interpretation of disjunction and its scope taking. And these authors use a one dimensional Hamblin semantics uh, in order to do this. Their intuition is that disjunction can be split into two steps. So, there's a first part, which I'm going to call a J operator. Uh, a junctor head, which will create a set, an alternative set, from its disjuncts. And then there's a higher operator, this existential operator, which is going to disjoin all of those alternatives and combine that into one Boolean disjunction. Now let's translate this intuition, this one-dimensional intuition, into the two-dimensional alternative semantics framework that we're adopting here. So J, that juncture head, will form an expression with no ordinary value, just like WH phrases. This is exemplified in 15. So J taking Bobby and Chris is going to give us the alternative set Bobby Chris, but no defined ordinary value. If we build a clause based on that, Alex likes Bobby, J Chris, then we get a set of propositions, Alex likes Bobby, Alex likes Chris as the alternative set, but no defined ordinary semantic value. So again, this is just like as if we used a WH phrase in there. The actual meaning for J, the proposal for J, is defined on the handout on, available online, not on these slides, in 14. Okay. So now, remember that in this alternative semantics approach, um, this alternative-based approach to disjunction, we want to also think about this higher operator, this existential operator, which is then going to create the actual disjunction. What will that existential operator look like in the two-dimensional framework that we're considering here? Let's think about two options. So the first option here is, I'm just going to call this uh, something I'm just going to call exists. So exists takes some sister alpha, and it's going to create a ordinary semantic value which is going to be the disjunction of that set of alternatives. Right? So far, so good. But this operator I, is going to be something that is going to just take the alternative set of its complement and pass that up. It's just not going to touch the alternative set. Now, this is, seems like a first approximation worth considering, a first option worth considering. But let's see what happens. If this exists operator applies to Alex likes Bobby J. Chris, then we get the Boolean disjunction for the ordinary value, which is actually what we want. But notice that there's a problem here. This violates interpretability, because that ordinary semantic value isn't actually in the set of alternatives. The set of alternatives has not been touched. It's just Alex likes Bobby and Alex likes Chris. So now we, here's a second option. The second option is a version of the exists operator, which is resetting. I'm going to refer to this, I'm going to pronounce this as exists reset. Exists reset does the same thing for the ordinary value. It creates an ordinary value by doing the disjunction of the set of alternatives. But then, now it's also a resetting operator. So it lexically specifies that the alternative set, after it applies, is now the singleton set of that disjunction as well. So if this applies to Alex likes Bobby J. Chris, 
Now we get that Boolean disjunction proposition as the ordinary value, and the alternative set is the singleton set of that proposition. And this satisfies interpretability. Okay, that's the background. So now let's turn to the framework. The intuition in this work is the following, that if we build a clause that contains a WH or J phrase in it, then we're going to end up with a beast that looks like 21. This is something where at the clausal, at the propositional level, the set of alternatives is a non-singleton set of propositional alternatives, but this object has no defined ordinary semantic value. And that obviously is not going to be interpretable. What we want to interpret is that ordinary semantic value, which also is set in the set of alternatives. Right. So we're going to have to fix this in some way. And I claim that alt shift exists without reset and exists reset are the only operators, the only three operators available in the grammar for fixing specifically this problem, specifically defining an ordinary semantic value given an object that doesn't have an ordinary semantic value. There are only these three options. So, for example, if we took that structure 21 we just built and we apply alt shift to it, then we're going to end up with an interpretable question. If we apply exists reset to it, then we're going to just get a disjunctive proposition. Now consider applying the non-resetting exists to 21. Well, this will define an ordinary semantic value, but as we previewed before, the result is going to still violate interpretability. So this is the general schema presented in 22. How can we fix this? Well, one option would be to apply a focus particle, which will fix the interpretability problem because focus particles have the side effect of resetting that alternative set and making it just the singleton set of the ordinary value that it just generated. Notice that focus particles also can't apply directly to the structure in 21 without the exists operator because there's no defined ordinary value there. We need projacents in order to actually use some object and actually compute a focus particle. So that's the basic framework. And now, for much of the rest of the talk, we'll be walking through a number of case studies. Let's see what this actually gets us. There are three types of case studies I want to highlight. So we'll look at WH indefinites, WH NPIs, and WH free choice items. And along the way, throughout, I'll be highlighting data from three Tibeto-Burman languages. Let's talk first about WH indefinites. Since J disjunctions and WH phrases create similar meanings, a language could apply exists reset to a WH containing clause, and that'll straightforwardly give us a WH indefinite. Right? So this is a logical form where we're applying exists reset to Alex likes who, and we get the Boolean disjunction. We get Alex likes Bobby or Chris or Dana. If we assume that that ranges over all the relevant individuals, that is Alex likes someone. And where it's also resetting, and therefore we end up with this interpretable meaning Alex likes someone. One option for doing this in a language would be to claim that J is actually the pronunciation of the disjunctive particle. The morpheme we identify in a language as disjunction is pronouncing J, right? And the exists reset operator corresponding to that doesn't have a morphological reflex, and therefore it can apply and just be null applying to disjunction over J, but it can also apply and be null applying to WH. So this is going to get us a language that has bare WH indefinites. But here's another option. So as noted in some previous literature, many languages use WH phrases together with disjunctive particles, over disjunctive particles, as their way of generating all indefinites. So here are a number uh, highlighted from the literature in 24. And in these languages, the pronunciation of disjunction, I claim, reflects the use of exists reset, even in the absence of J. So again, taking the disjunctive morphology, what do we attribute that to? I claim that in these languages, the disjunctive particle that we pronounce is showing us, it's the morphological reflex of the use of exists reset, and J itself may not have a morphological reflex. 
Now I'd like to highlight one particular case study from the Tibeto-Burman language of Tiwa from Ginny Dawson's work, which offers a nice example of the disjunctor as actually the morphological realization of a version of the exists reset operator rather than the pronunciation of J. So this language Tiwa has two WH indefinite series. There's the WH key and the WH pa series. Both of them at first glance here gives us something just meaning someone. But when we take a look at this in some embedded contexts, what we see is that WH pa consistently takes narrow scope, WH key takes wide scope. So here's a sentence roughly, if Saldi meets some nun, she would be very happy. If we use the WH pa series, that has to be a narrow scope indefinite, meaning that any meeting any nun would be happy. Um, but if we use a WH key series, then that's a wide scope indefinite. There's a specific nun that if Saldi meets, she would be happy. This interestingly correlates with the scope taking behavior of two different disjunctors that exist in the language, pronounced ba and ki, which at least diachronically we could hypothesize are related to WH pa and WH ki, that extra morphology on WHs. So in 27, we see that we have two ways of saying if Mukton or Mombor comes, Saldi would be happy. If we use the ba disjunctor, then that's a narrow scope disjunction. So here's a context in 27a, I won't read out loud. If we use the key disjunction, that's a wide scope disjunction. So I'm going to refer you to Jenny Dawson's work uh, for additional scope facts from other environments as well. But this uniform wide scope of the key disjunctor and the WH key indefinites and the uniform narrow scope of, w, of the ba disjunction and WH pa indefinites can be explained if ki on the one hand and ba pa on the other hand realize different versions of the exists reset operator. Ki is the morphological realization reflecting the use of a version of exists reset which lexically specifies taking widest scope whereas the pronunciation of ba or pa reflects the use of a version of exists reset which lexically specifies taking narrower scope. I think there are different ways of implementing that, but we see that there's this correlation there that we can capture in this way. Now I'd like to move on to NPIs, starting with WH even NPIs. So NPIs in many languages has been analyzed as involving an overt or covert even. So there's this intuition in a lot of literature that NPIs are an even associated with an indefinite. Let's see how this works. So here's our basic semantics for even repeated from above. So uh, here the idea is that even will take some, uh, some complement alpha and it doesn't touch the ordinary semantic value but it introduces a presupposition that the projacent is the least likely alternative. This scalar meaning of even associated with an indefinite will be unsatisfiable unless it's crossing into a downward and tailing environment, explaining NPI behavior. So let's see how this happens, uh, just give a quick sketch. So even associating with something like I saw someone, where someone has alternatives, roughly the horn alternatives, someone, many, and everyone. Let's see what even gives us in this case. Even is going to say that the projacent I saw someone is less likely. So I saw someone is less likely than that I saw many, and I saw someone is less likely than that I saw everyone. And if we think about this carefully, right, this is something that's just unsatisfiable in any context. Right? And it's that unsatisfiable presupposition from even which gives us this bad structure. But if this even is actually crossing some downward and tailing operator, such as negation, then actually this is going to be satisfiable. It's going to be grammatical. So this is a hypothesis for the analysis of something like I didn't see anyone. So notice that we get the negation in the scope of even. So negation will apply pointwise to each of the alternatives that I saw. I didn't see someone. I didn't see many. I didn't see everyone. So even is going to use its same semantics and say the projacent is the least likely alternative. Now we can unpack those negations and it'll just flip the order of the likelihood. So this is actually giving us now a presupposition that that I saw someone is more likely than that I saw many. 
and that I saw someone is more likely than that I saw everyone. And this is indeed a satisfiable presupposition. This is basically a tautology. Now I'd like to highlight the use of this in one particular language with a WH even series, uh, which is going to be Tibetan here. So Tibetan has a WH even NPI series, also WH one even NPI series, um, but bare WH words are not indefinite. So we see some examples in 30, so who is su, and anyone, the NPI, is su yang or su ye, but the word for the indefinite someone is something totally different, michik, it's just one person. So this gives us the NPI, the su yang is uh, the NPI in 31, so we can say su yang lip masong for no one arrived, but you can't say su yang lip song. Now, I claim that Tibetan has a free covert exists without reset operator, but no covert free exists reset. How does this work? So in 32, we first build the clause who arrived, and now I'm gonna apply the exists operator to it. That's going to give us the proposition that someone arrived as the ordinary value, but we're gonna have the original alternatives that let's just say A arrived, B arrived, C arrived, passing that up as the set of alternatives. And this is going to violate interpretability, right? So we need to fix this in some way. We'll fix this interpretability problem using even because it's a resetting operator. So if we apply even to this, we get the same ordinary semantic value. Remember that even doesn't change the ordinary value. We just have someone arrived. But now the alternative set has been reset. So it's just the singleton set of someone arrived. And now that's interpretable. But even, by using even, we've introduced a new presupposition, another requirement that needs to be satisfied. In this case, that, again, that someone arrived is less likely than any particular individual arrived. And that's not satisfiable. That's an unsatisfiable presupposition. However, now if we additionally introduce a downward entailing operator in between, like negation, now what we get is the proposition that no one arrived, and that is also going to be interpretable because even again applies last and it's resetting. But in this case, because that ordering has been flipped with negation, that presupposition introduced by even is satisfiable, though tautological. This explains why the use of even is obligatory in these WH even NPIs, even though the addition of even doesn't make a contribution to the overall meaning expressed. Even's function here is to repair the violation of interpretability, but at the cost of turning this into an NPI. Now, regular evens aren't the only way of generating an NPI, and here we're going to look at Burmese as another way of forming NPIs. So Burmese forms WH NPIs using a cleft semantics particle, ma, and this comes from my joint work with my student Keely Nu uh, from our SALT paper last year. So we propose that ma basically has cleft-like semantics. So this just doesn't touch the ordinary semantic value, but it's going to introduce this presupposition that all less likely alternatives are false. Now, wh with ma in Burmese also gives us an NPI. This is grammatical with negation, but ungrammatical with the uh, affirmative verb for I didn't take any apples. And here, again, just like Tibetan, I propose that Burmese has free covert exists without reset, but no exists reset that can be used here. Let one, two, and three be apples in this context. If we apply the non-resetting exists to I took which apple, then we get I took one, or I took two, or I took three as the proposition, the ordinary value. But this is not interpretable because the alternative set is the individual disjuncts, I took one, I took two, I took three. We want to fix this in some way. Now, applying ma, ma is a focus particle which is resetting, that'll be interpretable, but now we have a separate problem, which is that ma introduces its own presupposition. Again, intuitively, that all less likely alternatives are false. But the prejacent is now, I took some off apple, and I took one is less likely than that. I took two is less likely, I took three is less likely. We want to negate all of those, and we end up with this presupposition that I didn't take one, I didn't take two, I didn't take three, and we're asserting that I took some apple. So these are 
not compatible with one another. Right? This assertion is just inherently incompatible with the presupposition generated by that particle ma. Now notice though that if we apply negation above this, we're going to flip the polarity of the assertion, but keep that presupposition as is. So now we've presupposed, we didn't take one, didn't take two, two, didn't take three, and we assert the negation of I took some apple. So this is now an object which is both interpretable through the use of ma as a resetting operator, and the assertion is compatible with the presupposition. So this is again using a scalar particle, but a scalar particle with a different meaning, and we've ended up again generating a wh and pi. Finally, let's take a look at free choice items using whs. As highlighted in uh, Yannick Yadou and Cheng's paper, there are actually a lot of different strategies that languages take morphologically in order to build such items. So they talk about things like wh ever in English and Korean has a wh na, wh disjunctive particle combination for free choice. There are also more interesting patterns such as the Dutch who then also, also giving us a free choice whoever. Um, here I'm going to mention and take a look at two patterns that are not mentioned in Yanakuru and Cheng. Um, again, coming from some Tibeto-Burman languages. So again, based on fieldwork by Keely Nu, uh, we know that WH only combinations give us free choice items in Burmese. Now, the use of only here for free choice is particularly interesting. Right? I think that this use of the exhaustive particle in the expression of free choice could be productively understood under the exhaustification approach to free choice, um, and I'll be, I have a sketch of this in an appendix to the handout. This combination of WH and only forming a free choice item is something that Hadas Kotek and I have also seen in a Mayan language Chu. Another example of a WH free choice item is exemplified in 41. This is the Tibetan expression su inayang, giving us free choice anyone. It's literally who, copula, conditional suffix, even. So in Tibetan, the conditional with even gives us an even if concessive conditional. And if that includes a WH phrase in it, that's going to give us an unconditional. So it's this unconditional expression that actually is giving us this free choice item use. Inayang by itself also functions as a concessive scalar particle. In Appendix A, I sketch an analysis for how we're getting this free choice item type distribution for this unconditional expression. We saw also in an earlier talk at Glow in Asia by Rahul Balusu that in a range of Dravidian languages, actually we have different morphological combinations that look very similar to this with conditional or even morphology together with WH phrases giving us, again, free choice items. Finally, I'd like to talk about the range of variation that exists cross-linguistically and how we want to account for that in this framework. So we know that not all languages have the same range of WH particle quantifier combinations. So how do languages vary? I propose that first, languages have differences in what operators are spelled out morphologically or what combinations are spelled out morphologically. And there also are syntactic restrictions on the placement of those helping operators, like alt shift exists and exists reset. We already saw a case of the different lexicalizations, not in section one, but in the first section of the case studies, that a disjunctive particle could morphologically realize either J or exists reset, which are the two logical ingredients of Boolean disjunction. But this framework can also model more complex inventories, and here I'll be advertising some of my earlier work. So in Toba Batak, which is a Austronesian language of Indonesia, there's a particle manang. Manang is the disjunctor, as in 42, you or me, uh, but also WH phrases together with manang create NPI free choice items. So in 43, without negation, si poltak mangalang manang aha, we get poltak eats anything, or with, with the negation, we get poltak doesn't eat anything. So here I propose that manang is the pronunciation of J or an exists operator, and I sketched that out in my AFLA talk from a couple years ago. I also have proposed that 
we can use this type of framework to account for the two disjunctors that exist in Mandarin. So Mandarin has the disjunction hai shi, which is generally uh, described as forming alternative questions, as well as huo zhe, which gives us logical disjunction. So earlier works have proposed that hai shi, but not huo zhe, has a plus wh or plus q feature. However, this difference is neutralized in certain environments. And for many speakers, the distribution of where these things actually get neutralized, that difference gets neutralized, turns out to be exactly the same places where WH phrases also have non-interrogative uses. So I propose that we can explain this straightforwardly under this type of framework by saying that hai shi and huo zhe are both realizations of adjunctor head J, but huo zhe has this specification saying that it has to have an exists operator, either exists without reset or exists reset nearby, but hai shi doesn't have this requirement, thereby passing up alternatives in most cases that end up getting alternative, uh, excuse me, end up getting interpreted as a question. And I sketched that in my manuscript a couple years ago, which is uh, currently in revision. The second way that languages may vary is by restricting the position of those helping operators. In many WH movement languages that have bare WH indefinites, the bare WH indefinites have to be in C2 or lower in the clause. So here's an example in 44, where if you move who to the beginning of the clause, we get a question interpretation. If we leave who in C2, then we get a WH indefinite interpretation. Here we can propose that the distribution of exists reset is syntactically restricted. In this case, it has some ceiling to it, so it has to attach at some height, but not higher. And therefore, if you move out of the scope of anywhere where you could put an exists reset, then now it has to be repaired by alt shift, giving you a question interpretation. Today I introduced a framework for productively understanding patterns of WH quantification cross-linguistically in a two-dimensional alternative semantics. The selling point here of this framework is that a number of basic independently motivated ingredients, WH, J, alt shift, exists and exists reset, all really independently motivated from that background that I presented, together model the behavior of many attested forms of WH quantification. Crucial here are the roles of interpretability and reset, those notions which I defined. These notions are really assumed in previous work in alternative semantics, but I think that these hold the key to understanding the frequent use of focus particles and disjunctive particles in WH quantification. So again, coming back to this question, why are focus particles and disjunctors commonly involved in WH quantification? The answer is twofold. First, that focus particles are unique in the grammar in being able to actually look at alternative sets and quantify over them. Regular lexical items aren't able to do that. And secondarily, disjunctive particles might be spelling out something like exists reset in some languages. And second of all, focus particles are also, at least by default, resetting, and therefore can repair violations of interpretability, especially as would be introduced by the application of the non-resetting exists operator. This frequent use of focus particles in WH quantification is unexplained by at least some earlier approaches to WH quantification, such as Kratzer and Shimoyama, although it's attempted in recent work by Anna Sabolchi. Um, those works, uh, the Kratzer and Shimoyama in particular, propose various operators that quantify over alternatives which are unrelated to focus particles. Really the selling point here is, can we use the regular semantics for focus particles that we've studied from the literature on focus particles and use them wholesale in order to understand the behavior of WH particle combinations? Thank you very much and I'd really appreciate any feedback you have.